psychology has a history, but it's not as old as some other subjects. And one of the reasons for that is because it didn't really develop until people started to look scientifically at what makes us tick. And so, I mean, psychology has a lot of different roots, but one of them was a branch of philosophy that got more and more interested in how people think and how the mind works. Um, but there are other roots as well, um, like uh, Breuer, Breuer's talking cure, leading Freud into, into investigating the unconscious mind and um, the counts of brain damage where, and what seems to happen when you damage certain parts of the brain that were coming through from medicine. So it wasn't really until all those kind of things came together and the idea of a, a scientific rigorous approach to, to that kind of knowledge um, became appropriate that psychology happened. And that wasn't until, well, the, the date we give is 1865, because that's when Wilhelm Wundt established his laboratory in Leipzig, it's the first psychological laboratory. And it's also when William James in America gave the first lecture at Harvard that was called psychology. So 1865 is a very precise date. Most sciences, scientists, sciences don't have as precise a starting date as that. One of the most exciting things that has happened in, in psychology recently has been what's come out of the ability to scan the human brain while it's still working. In other words, to be able to, to look at what's happening in the brain when we're thinking about new things or doing something or feeling something. And it's so exciting because what we found out is the brain doesn't have, it's not about different areas that do different things, it's all about networks, that the brain has complex networks and lots of different areas of the brain are involved when, uh, when we do something. And it shows us connections we didn't, well, we, we only sort of knew about. For instance, why we dance to music. When we hear music, the part of the brain that's, that's absorbing the music is also linked directly with, with parts of the brain involved in movement. And dance is fundamental in every uh, human society, really. And, and so we can see why now, you know, it's connected. And then there's um, mirror neurons, where, which the discovery that we have neurons in our own brain, which activate the parts of the brain. If we're watching somebody do something, or feel an experience or, or something like that. Um, we activate parts of our own brain which would be the same if we were doing that thing. So um, if I see you deeply upset, that triggers off some of the upset brain parts in my own brain. And that's, you know, it's the basis of empathy. And empathy is so important for a social animal. You know, we, we live together and it gives us a little bit of understanding of other people's experiences because we have neurons which can mirror that within our own uh, brains. And um, so, so that's important. And then we, the other thing we've done is to knock on the head this stupid idea that brain development stopped when you, after puberty or, or when you reached adulthood or something like that, because we know that the brain is able to develop new pathways and new structures all the time, all through life. You know, we, we, we knew that anyway, sort of, by clinical experience with people with strokes. You know, if you believe it's possible and you work hard enough, you can recover from a stroke, you can get back the functions that you lost. So neuroplasticity, you know, used to think, we used to think that that stopped at the age of 12 or so, and it doesn't, it continues right through life. I think psychology has always had a bit of a dark side, really, and that's understandable because if you're going to be learning about how the human mind works, there are always those who will take it and use it for nefarious means. Probably I would identify three main areas here. There's uh, psychological testing, or certainly IQ testing, which has always been used, or was always used, certainly in the early years, to rationalise nasty ideas like eugenics, which is the idea that people of inferior intelligence should be dissuaded from bre breeding or, or even compulsory sterilised. And right up until the 1970s or 80s, um, there were still compulsory sterilisation laws, you know, based on IQ and things for people who were supposed to be inferior. And then there's the, the whole thing about ethics, ethics in experiments and in uh, animal 
experiments and, and human experiments as well. There have always been some very dodgy ones. Uh, and it wasn't really until the 1980s that psychology cleaned up its act on that one and developed um, ethical criteria. And then there's, um, there's of course, the, the, the Cold War stuff, you know, the M MK Ultra mind control experiments, which were distinctly nasty um, and not for any other purpose than to manipulate and control people or brainwash them. And uh, they, I mean, they were clandestine, um, but they certainly used psychology and psychologists in all sorts of ways, uh, many of whom didn't know they were being used by the CIA, but were uh, solicited by or funded by organisations which looked to be quite, quite all right on the surface. I think uh, modern psychology was very much shaped by what happened during the war and the, um, the different ways that psychology was used, particularly after World War II. I mean, all wars shape, have shaped you know, psychology that it's been involved in, but, uh, but World War II involved using psychology in all sorts of different ways. It involved looking at uh, cognitive psychology, the dimensions of um, attention and, and memory and how people could make sense of things, how accidents happened. The other thing about the war is what happened afterwards, because with the Cold War in particular, we got a lot of very, very unpleasant um, experiments going on in secret. Um, the, we hear a lot about the secret CIA experiments, and they really did happen. If you Google MK Ultra, which is what the project was called, uh, you get all sorts of things coming up, most of which are true. The CIA engaged in a lot of clandestine experiments with drugs, with brainwashing techniques, sensory deprivation, all sorts of things. And they did so in a particularly brutal way. They used populations which couldn't complain, um, like they experimented with children, but they chose those children from families who, where their parents were involved in child abuse who couldn't complain what happened to their child because they, they would be exposed as abusers. Um, they used prisoners, they used members of the armed forces, and trying out different drugs, different chemicals, all sorts of things. For me personally, I think probably one of the most exciting new developments in psychology was, um, was the development of positive psychology. We've always had this tendency to emphasise the darker side, you know, to, to look at emotions in terms of fear and anger and, and negative emotions. And yet, actually, most of our day-to-day -day life is, is experiencing positive emotions. The trouble is that we don't recognise those and we don't encourage I mean, look at our fiction, it's all about murders and nasty, the nastier side of human nature. A lot of people's lives are are positive and, and you get lots of everyday positive things but we don't notice them as much as we notice the bad things. One nasty remark can upset you for a whole day whereas one positive remark can lift you for half an hour but then it doesn't balance out. Anyway, I think that uh, when Seligman introduced positive psychology in the year 2000 what he did was to bring together a lot of research which was showing how we can flourish, how we can make our lives positive, meaningful, and how we, uh, how we can study the good side of life. One of the places psychology is going in the future is that we're getting, we have a much greater recognition of the diversity of human beings. And I think um, that's important because Traditionally, psychological experiments were always conducted on weird populations. That is, Western, educated, industrialised, rich and democratic societies, people produced from those societies. And um, that has distorted psychology quite a lot. I mean, you found, for instance, in the social identification studies, that they're fine, you know, the basic mechanisms are all right, they applied in Western po populations, in weird populations, but they didn't necessarily apply in the Far East, you know, in, in Asian populations, in Southeast Asian populations, where community was very much more highly regarded and group membership processes, therefore, were a little bit different. And so one of the ways psychology has been going, it has been increasing recognition of the importance 
of diversity in a population, not, not, not just within a population, but also of acknowledging that what's true of maybe American undergraduates is not necessarily true of uh, the rest of the world. So the, the weird population, the Western educated, industrialized, rich and democratic populations are not the be all and end all of the human being. And in fact, they're not even the majority of human beings. And so we need to um, continue to recognize those. And that's part of our emphasis on uh, diversity and inclusivity and making a psychology that is much more representative of human beings as a whole.